Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming to 516 Arts tonight. I'm Suzanne Sparge. I'm the executive director and the found, founder. And um, I'm really excited you're all here. I'm, I'm really uh, so happy to welcome Margaret Randall and Josie Lopez to speak tonight. Um, I would first like to start by introducing uh, Rachel Pablo, who is our new curator here on staff. She is um, going to also do a land acknowledgement to start off the evening. So welcome, Rachel. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, Yat A means hello, and she A Rachel Pablo Yanesha Techitni Nishle and um Toiglini Bashis Chin Do Sinjikene Dashache Bashchi um Dashinella. And I am originally from Gallup, New Mexico, and it's nice to meet you all. And I'm gonna do the land acknowledgement and this was written by Roger Frawa, who's a board member, and um, he's from the Jemez Pueblo. And although I'm Dine, I'm, I still consider myself a visitor. And um, I just kind of think that heightens awareness that we are on Puebloan territory. And um, so, so this includes the southern band of the Athabascan people, which is Dine and the Apache people, including the Utes. So um, their respective ancestors, those living today and the unborn, this land always has been, is currently, and will always be for the winged, the fin, and four-legged. I'd like to acknowledge the sacred living waters and rivers that cross this land. Finally, the sun, the moon, and all the stars and planets that keep our system in balance. We welcome you all and thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'd also like to thank our board chair, Danny Lopez, who's here tonight. Give it Danny a hand. <laughs> this awesome leadership. Yeah. And his partner, Cherie, is here too. Yay, Cherie. Um, and um, I, does, I, I just want to call out to our staff, who is, they're, they're phenomenal. Um, Daniel Ubibari is here um, recording tonight's event and live streaming it, so people are watching online. And he's also the curator of the current exhibition Upstairs, that's Nathaniel Tetsuro Palinelli downtown. And um, yeah, afterwards, ask Daniel all your questions about the show up here. And uh, Kevin Paul is here on our staff, and Viola Arduini is here somewhere, and uh, Claude Smith is downstairs, and, uh, and you just met Rachel, so that's the crew here. Um, 516 Arts is a nonprofit organization. We have uh, membership available with various perks for becoming a member and also supporting the work that we do here. Um, there's a brochure over there. Um, we have newsletters about what's coming up. Um, the next event after tonight's will be July 14th, and it's a talk called Leaving O'Keefe Country, and it features the artist Josh T. Franco, who will be speaking about his installation downstairs on the subject of O'Keefe Country, and he'll be in conversation with Cody Hartley, who's the director of the O'Keefe Museum, and Alicia Inez Guzman, who's a writer and activist. So that'll be a great night. And um, we have Margaret's new book for sale, Artists in My Life. It's all at the back table, so she'll sign for you hopefully tonight um, if you'd like to purchase a copy. And we also have an exhibition catalog for the downstairs exhibition. It's called Art Meets History New Mexico. And it's the um, it covers both of the two exhibitions. The one that's downstairs now, Technologies of the Spirit, is part two. And it looks at the multiple histories of New Mexico uh, and involved working art, contemporary artists working with the historic photography archives at the Albuquerque Museum and um, reflecting on their own uh, cultural backgrounds. And um, so the catalog uh, covers that whole project. Um, and lastly, I'd like to, without further ado, introduce Josie Lopez, a PhD, who is curator of art at the Albuquerque Museum. We were so fortunate that she worked at 516 Arts as a curator for a year and a half or two, not too long ago. And um, 
She holds a BA in history, an MA in teaching from Brown, an MA in art history from UNM, and a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Josie, who will introduce Margaret, and they're going to have a conversation. Thank you, Suzanne. It's uh, great to be back. Um, this was home for a couple of years, so I'm glad to see that your staff is thriving and growing and you all are up to some amazing projects. So anytime that you have the feeling that you want to support um, institutions like 516 Arts who are really supporting contemporary art, um, it's a great, a great program to support, so glad to help. Um, Iconic writer and activist, um, Margaret Randall, um, is uh, probably someone who doesn't really need an introduction, but I think it's important to celebrate and get a sense of all of the incredible um, things that she's accomplished in life, everything ranging from a creative life lived well to an incredibly important political activist life and how all of those things kind of come together in this book. And so I look forward to being able to talk about that um, in a little bit. Randall um, is a feminist poet, essayist, oral historian, translator, photographer, and social <coughs> activist. Born in New York City, she's lived for extended periods of time in Albuquerque, New York, Sevilla, Sevilla Mexico City, Havana, Managua um, in the turbulent 60s, she co-founded and co-edited El Corno Emplumado, The Plumed Horn, a bilingual literary journal out of Mexico City, which for eight years published some of the most dynamic and meaningful writing of an era. I hope we get to talk about that a little bit. Um, she lived among New York's abstract expressionists in the 1950s and early 60s, shared the rebellion of the beats, Participated in the New Mexican student in the Mexican excuse me student movement of 1968. Lived in Cuba during the second decade of the Cuban Revolution. Resided in Nicaragua during the first four years of the Sandinista project and visited North Vietnam during the heroic last months of the U.S. American War. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Margaret, who's going to. Uh, read for us, and then we'll enter into um, some conversation. See if I can get up on this. Yeah. No, I'm fine, thanks. Well, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, 516 Arts. Um, thank you, Josie, of course. Uh, thank you, the staff here has been wonderful even before uh, coming tonight. I think, I don't know how many emails I've had from Viola um, about making it perfect, you know, the, the, the conditions. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I'm also particularly uh, happy to welcome uh, Sabre Moore and Roger Mignon, who came all the way down from Abiquiu. Uh, Sabre is in this book. Um, there's a chapter on her art, wonderful artist, and uh, other friends who've come from Santa Fe and here in Albuquerque. And so I hope it'll be a good evening. I'm going to um, read just a few pages that I've written, um, sort of explaining uh, the genesis of this book. Um, and then um, I look forward to entering in conversation with Josie. So, um, of the many books I've written in my 85 years, artists in my life may seem like a departure. It isn't. I've always had a profound relationship with visual artists. My mother was a sculptor, and the original work of many artists hung on the walls of my childhood home. Um, I'd also like to mention that uh, Lisa Goldman is here, and Lisa's father was one of the uh, wonderful artists in the 40s and 50s here in Albuquerque who um, were part of the group that I grew up with. Visiting museums was a thrill in any city we visited. During the late 1950s and early 60s, I lived among the abstract expressionists in New York City 
and they became close friends, uh, some mentors. Anthony Zacharias and I frequently walked the more than 80 blocks from our tenement apartments on the Lower East Side to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where I remember being seduced by graceful scenes on Greek terracotta vases, among other things. I had my first spontaneous orgasm standing before a Mark Rothko painting at the moment. <laughs> I didn't know whether to include that or not, but. <laughs> um, in Mexico, where I founded and for eight years edited the magazine that Josie mentioned, um, we published drawings by hundreds of vanguard artists. And I continue to have many artist friends and learn from them as I went on to live in Cuba and then in Nicaragua. In New York, the artists I knew often gifted me their work. When I moved to Mexico in 1961, I brought with me paintings by Elaine and Willem de Kooning, Franz Klein, Pat Pasloff, Milton Resnick, Sam Francis, Al Held, and others, most from the abstract expressionist movement. In Mexico, my collection grew. Many of that country's important artists donated work to the journal. We published drawings by Felipe Edinburgh, David Alfaro Siqueiros, Jose Luis Cuevas, Leonora Carrington, and others. They often told us to keep the work or to sell it to benefit the publication going forward. By the time I had to flee Mexico for Cuba, my collection was impressive. A friend packed it up and took it to the Cuban embassy where comrades said they would ship it to Havana. My intention was that it be housed at the Havana Art Museum for the benefit of the public. I've never been able to find out what happened to those paintings. I know they arrived in Havana, but when I visited the museum, I was told they were being cleaned. I checked periodically, but I never saw them again. Years later, I learned that the museum director at the time had been fired for corruption. Did she sell them? Give them to her friends? Who knows? A decade later, I left Cuba for Nicaragua and slowly began building a new collection mostly by local artists. But I want to emphasize that I never thought of the art with which I surrounded myself as a collection, a word that implies specialization or even investment in my mind. It was simply an integral part of my life. When I returned to the United States in 1984, I hoped to send my paintings home. They filled a container which was supposed to be loaded onto a ship in the port of Corinto, but the US already waging the Contra War mined that port and sending one's possessions by sea was no longer a possibility. Once again, I lost the art that I treasured. Over the past four decades, my wife Barbara and I have slowly amassed work that we love. Sometimes the artists gifted us their paintings. Sometimes we traded or purchased them Early in her career, when Elaine de Kooning sold a painting, she used a quarter of what she earned to buy one from a younger artist. I took to doing the same thing, dedicating a part of what I made from my books to buying art by those coming up. It was a sort of creative tithing. Three years ago, we moved from our last home to a tiny condo and no longer had room on the walls of, for all that art. We feel fortunate that the Albuquerque Museum and the Museum of the University of New Mexico were willing to accept much of it for their permanent collections. Although we live in a very small space now, our walls are still covered with paintings. We couldn't live any other way. And although I never seriously tried making visual art myself, the processes followed by friends in the genre influenced my creative process. Early on, I modeled for art classes, including here at the University of New Mexico. Like waitressing or working as a receptionist, it was a job a young, unschooled woman could get back then. I remember thinking as I posed how much I would rather be the subject than the object of that practice. Many years later, I would write an essay about artists' muses. It's called, What Were They Thinking? In it, I imagine what some of the great women artists may have been thinking as they posed for their more famous male counterparts. Camille Claudel for Auguste Rodin, Frida Kahlo for Diego Rivera, George O'Keeffe 
for Stieglitz and the series of women who posed for Pablo Picasso. If anyone is interested in that essay, it's in a book that came out last year called Thinking About Thinking, published by Caso Raca Press. In New York, I remember Milton Resnick telling the young poet I was at the time that I must sit before my typewriter for a specific number of hours each day, thus teaching me about the role of discipline in any artistic practice. Around the same time, Elaine de Kooning and I happened to be at an art supply store on Fourth Avenue. I noticed a brush caressed its soft hairs and remarked on the beauty of the $50 implement, saying it must feel good to work with something like that. Although she knew I wasn't a painter, Elaine bought me that brush on the spot, saying something about the need for excellent materials, quote, especially for someone whose talent didn't yet enable her to make something from nothing. I never used that gift, of course, but it sat on my desk for years reminding me of the importance of always having the best tools for my own craft. In 2015, I was invited to lead a gallery tour for Elaine de Kooning's exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC. Preparing my script, I realized I'd written more about visual art than I thought. Eventually, I expanded that text, and it became the first chapter of this book that we're going to be talking about tonight a fortuitous reconnection with the daughter of two sculptors who visited us in Mexico in the mid-60s led to the research and memories that went into chapter two. I began to think seriously about the visual artists whose work has accompanied and impacted my creative journey. Names like Leandro Katz, Jane Norling, and Gay Block came to mind. I knew I wanted to include photographers, sculptors, muralists and architects, as well as painters. Soon I understood that I had a great deal to say about the artists I've known, and the book unfolded from there. Artists in My Life speaks on, in revealing ways about a dozen or so visual artists whose work has impacted my own. Some drew on rock walls or in desert sands thousands of years ago. Some were mentors or close friends. Some I never met, but their work is a constant in my imagination. One I married. I look at these artists' lives and at what they've created from multiple interwoven angles as makers of art, social commentators, women in a world that dominated by patriarchal values and in solitude or collaboration with communities in the larger artistic arena. I go beneath the surface asking questions and telling stories. I combine biographical material with personal anecdotes. I wanted to answer questions such as, why is it that visual art, drawing, painting, sculpture, photography, architecture, grabs me, and in particular instances, feels as if it changes me at the molecular level? Why does the image continue to live in my memory? And how do art and memory interact? How do reason and intuition come together in art? In what ways is art necessary to the health of a society? What does it take to be an artist? What is it about the work of certain artists that touches my emotions? Do women and men make art differently? What have women artists had to give up in order to make their art? What does anyone who devotes his or her life to making art have to give up in societies that don't really create artistic, uh, that don't support cre artistic creativity? How do sexually, sexual identity, male, female, lesbian, gay, transgender, and non-binary, as well as class, race, and ethnicity impact the making of art? Does great art change the viewer? Does it change the artist? How does art act upon human relationships, upon the environment, upon the future? Can art calm violence, heal the human spirit? And these are tremendously important questions, I think, especially in the last few weeks when we've all begun to realize how much more serious the assault is than perhaps we could have imagined, although we should have imagined. How is art making preserved ancient ways of telling or recast itself across cultures and centuries? 
what impact do new or old technologies have on the art making process? How does art travel through time? Are visual artists different from the rest of us? How are they shaped by the ways in which they understand and render perception, perspective, energy, scale, color, line? To respond to these questions, I've dug deep, interrogating my living subjects as well as those artists long gone by looking at their lives and work through the lenses of class, race, gender, and culture. Those who are friends were forthcoming through many conversations and generous in allowing me to reproduce their work. I reached back to examine art left 10,000 years ago on rock walls in the canyons of the US American Southwest and compared it with what members of the mural mo movement paint on modern day walls in San Francisco. I've considered the intricate drawings made by European explorers of Ma Mexico's Maya kingdom and a photographer who looked through his camera at the same structures from the same angles several hundred years later. Time and place are also protagonists in this book. And of course, I wanted a publisher who would be willing to design the book like the work of art it should be including the more than 70 full color plates that illustrate the text. Previous experience with New Village assured me it was the press I wanted for this project, and I was happy when it found a home there. From the very beginning of its journey into the world, artists in my life has generated the kind of response I've hoped for. And I hope that tonight we can um, share more comments, questions, um, conversation, and so I'll leave it there and invite uh, Josie back up to um, to share the, the lectern with me. Thank you. One of the things that I really sort of thought about a lot at the beginning when I started getting into the material and reading the book, you start with four incredible women artists. Elaine de Kooning, Ferdy Jansen, Fergie to Jerry Dent Jensen, Frida Kahlo, and George O'Keefe. It's really interesting to think about each of those women, but what you do is you look at and think about and ask the question of, is it a woman artist or is it an artist who happens to be a woman? And I thought it would be interesting if you could talk to that a little bit um, in terms of those first chapters and how that becomes a real anchoring point. What a wonderful question, Josie. Um, I'm glad you asked it because time and place are um, so important to me that I wanted my memoir, uh, published in, in 2019, I guess, by Duke. I, it, it's called I Never Left Home, and I wanted the subtitle to be a, a, a memoir of time and place. And the publisher didn't like that, so that was that. But my feeling is that um, everything depends on time and, and place. Uh, when you ask about a woman artist or a woman who happens to be an artist, it depends on the time. You know, I can remember that Elaine de Kooning never wanted to be called a woman artist. Uh, she was a fierce feminist, although she probably wouldn't have used that word. And we're talking, you know, the 1960s before the second wave of feminism really came um, on the scene. Um, and she felt that she needed to make it and wanted to make it and could make it in a world of men. So she was just an artist. Um, we may call her a woman artist, but she didn't call herself that. And then um, there were people like Ferdy uh, Jansen, who um, had a very, very supportive um, relationship with her husband, also a, a fine artist. They're, the two of them uh, are chapter two of this book. And um, so, you know, she, she was free. She was a little later in time. Um, she was in Europe in place rather than in New York. And she was able to think of herself proudly as a woman artist. Um, so I think that it all depends, you know, we as women have undoubtedly had more trouble um, being recognized for our work, um, getting our work shown, getting it um, 
published, you know, whether we're an artist or a writer or a musician, whatever. This is still true for women. Um, so I think that, you know, um, it really depends uh, on the time. And, uh, but there's the work, and the work speaks for itself. Yeah, and I also think the relationships that you describe, how each of them had a very different relationship to the men in their lives, and how that also had an impact in the way that they saw themselves as either women artists or artists who happened to be women. You know, it was impacted by some of those relationships in some ways in a really negative way, but in other ways, um, you know, with um, this sh Shinkichi, am I saying that correctly? Sh Shinkichi. Shinkichi um, and Ferdy and reading about how they created their own family unit in a way that was very different from the way that we think about patriarchal structures and, and male versus female and comparing that to, for example, Elaine de Kooning's experience where she almost shrunk from the relationship. And so that, that idea, this sense that we could build our own family, I thought was fascinating in that particular chapter and how it was juxtaposed with the other, the other three women that were in the first part of that book. Yeah, actually, um, it's interesting because what fascinates me about Shinkishi Tajiri and Ferdi and their two daughters and their two studio assistants um, who visited us in Mexico in the 60s and spent about four months renting um, a rooftop room in our neighborhood. Um, it wasn't just that they had this marvelously supportive family um, in terms of gender equality. Um, they, uh, Shinkishi was Japanese. He spent time in the, um, in the internment camps here in the United States. Um, his wife was Dutch. Uh, their two studio assistants, one was German and one was Japanese. So it was not only that they uh, um, manifest this amazing sort of um, family relationship, but it was like, you know, this was just 20 years after the Second World War. And suddenly here was this family that was made up of Japanese, German, Dutch, um, and they had these two little, little children, these two little girls. Uh, who were six and eight at the time, and it's actually a phone call from the eight-year-old, who's now in her 60s, um, that started me writing this book. She called me uh, one day, about a year and a half ago, and uh, said, I, you probably don't remember me, and I, of course I said, yes, I, I absolutely remember you. And she said, well, my sister and I are, um, are doing some research about our both parents dead by this time, about our parents' work, and um, that sort of started me thinking about them. Um, Elaine de Kooning had a very ambiguous relationship to uh, Willem de Kooning, her husband. Um, she, I think, benefited enormously, enormously from being his wife um, at the beginning, but she was also always in his shadow. So, you know, so that was tricky too. And, and then, of course, um, uh, George O'Keefe basically had to live apart from her husband to have the kind of conditions and space that she needed to work. So, you know, I think, I think it's different. Again, time and place play a part there. Well, in our relationships with how we think about feminism and women's roles, and one thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately because we currently have a project on La Madinche and how women's roles become social expectations, but then how do we internalize those expectations and then that becomes part of our identity and our relationships, right, with the people that we interact with. And I think that was something that was really beautiful in the way that these particular women that you decided to kick the book off with, who are, you know, icons of, of in the art world, so really fascinating. But I think maybe we'll shift gears a little bit because time is something, there were a couple of phrases about time that I really wanted to unpack. Time exists as a simultaneous pattern of events. Only human consciousness imbues it with sequence. And to me that was really fascinating because here we are going through your story your interactions with these people that are jumping all over the place. 
And what I realize when I read this particular phrase is that it's not about, a, it's about continuity and simultaneity rather than a linear view of how our lives unfold. And I realized that that was the crux of where the book, hopefully, what I was hoping, I was kind of doing that chapter where you talked about Lucy Lepard reading your mind. I was hoping that that's where it was going in, and it does turn out to be that. I'm so, so glad that you, that you got that from it. Um, you know, it's also about looking back. It's about how time shifts when we're living it, and then as we um, consider it years later. I think that that's something that's, um, that I try to explore in the chapter on Leandro Katz, when he is, he is making art from drawings, making photographs, uh, using the same angle and position and so forth in the Mayan ruins in southern Mexico, as um, uh, Catherwood uh, made his drawings uh, a century and a half before. And um, so there's that, that sort of bending or collapsing of time that we don't, you know, it's, I don't think we realize it, we can't realize it as we're experiencing it, but then looking back on it, um, it begins to unpack itself, it begins to um, unfold. Um, but I'm very glad that you got that from it, because, it, you know, it, it's nice for an author to feel that uh, someone gets what she's trying to do. Well, I'm glad I got that right. <laughs> that would have been embarrassing. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, again, you know, and, and so then at this point, it kind of, um, we're on this journey, and we're, we're understanding and we're learning about the, not only the relationships that you're building, about memory, and your interaction with memory, and other people's memories. Um, I was really fascinated by the Catherwood Project. And how I was not expecting to go from sort of this very familiar world of painterly discussion around the artists that you were looking at, but then we're thrust into this whole other world that's embedded in probably one of the most iconic natural places in the world. I not even probably, absolutely. But then how this particular woman then becomes the driving force behind what the architectural statements are that then help define that natural space. What, what was it the architect who was um, part of, am I getting that? Oh, no, that's uh, Mary Elizabeth Jane Coulter. Okay, yeah. so I'm getting Coulter and the, and the Catherwood Project confused. That's okay. I mean, there is a connection between all of these people, so that... That makes sense. So could you talk then about, not, not Coulter, but the Catherwood project and the way that that architecture becomes a key defining element of, of place? Yes, uh, I think I can talk a little bit about that. I mean, Leandro does such a good job of not only talking about it in his, in his interviews and, and written work, but of presenting it, you know, making us feel that were there in, in the pieces. I saw this um, part of the Catherine project, which is a very large project. I'm not sure it's, it's ever been shown fully anywhere in the world, although parts of it have been shown in museums uh, all over the world. Uh, I saw it for the first time at Site Santa Fe at one of their biennials maybe, I don't know, probably six, seven years ago. Um, and uh, Leandro is someone I've known since the 60s. He's a poet, a filmmaker, an Argentinian uh, artist, um, who's, I don't know if any of you have seen one of his works that just thrills me, is owned by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It's the one where uh, he has all these faces of the moon um, uh, coded uh, with uh, letters and numbers and you know, you do different things with it. His work is very often interactive. And this piece of his, the Catherwood Project, is interactive in the sense that he visited, over a period of many years, these uh, Mayan ruins, which of course were not natural. They were built by a, a whole civilization that was brilliant. 
Um, and, and then he, um, he re-edited uh, from the, what he assumed were the same positions, the same levels, the same angles, uh, some of um, Catherwood's drawings. Um, so the, and, and there's one piece that I particularly love because I think it speaks to what you're speaking to, which is this issue of time and place. Um, and I think it's, I believe it's reproduced in the book. It's a photograph of his hand holding one of his photographs um, in front of the actual place uh, where the photograph was made, which is the same place where the drawing was made so many years before. Um, so this has to do with materiality. It has to do with technology. It has to do with that movement also in time and space. You know, we live at a time now where um, technological uh, things are possible that we never would have dreamed about in, in our childhood or our youth. So, um, yes, I don't know if that answers your yeah, question. Yeah, it, it does, and it also was sort of a lead-in question um, because what I, I wanted to set up this idea or this thinking around how in our current way of looking at land and thinking about ecology and the environment, this idea of outside and inside, are we, are we part of this environment or are we looking from the outside in reflecting on it? And so like the Nazca lines for me are very much these beautiful, you know, scapes that you're, they move you and you're interested in, but is it, is it really, you know, in, in a different way, you're, it's not necessarily um, a personal, internal kind of reflection as being part of nature and environment. And I think the comparison between that and Sabra Moore was actually really interesting to me because then you shift to this much more profoundly um, feminist view of ecology. And, and the distinction between those two I thought was really fascinating. Yeah. I I enjoyed making connections in this in this book. I hope I did you justice, Sabra. Um, I hope I did them all justice. Um, one of the things that, that fascinated me about Edward Rani's uh, photographs of the Nazca lines is that we've always seen those lines photographed from above, from an airplane. Um, and, you know, the, the legend or the myth, I guess you would say, um, has it that these drawings, these immense drawings in the northern part of Peru um, were actually made by aliens or they were made by somebody who, you know, who had this whole landscape as, as their palette. Um, when in fact, of course, they were made by the people who lived there. And Rani's uh, photographs are taken from ground level. They're the only photographs I've ever seen of the Nazca lines that were taken um, at the level of, so the people, the viewer, um, the photographer and the viewer are, are right there um, where the people were who were setting these stones in lines. Um, I just had the privilege of meeting Randy for the first time a few weeks ago in Santa Fe. Um, I didn't know him when I wrote the book, and uh, I, but I knew his book, and of course I was fascinated by it, and then I, we had the opportunity to meet and go to his studio, and he showed us photographs of um, the stonework in not only uh, the Maya world, but the Inca world and, and other places, and um, you know, I just realized this this man sees um, what I see, but he can do something with it, and, and I can't. So, um, so that was very important. Um, I think that uh, that what is that connection? You know, what is it that connects us to any piece of art, to any work of art? It's an experience. It's feeling that we're right there. Um, it's what the painting or the sculpture or the photograph or whatever it is, uh, it's what it makes us feel. It's not what it, what we uh, discover because we're art historians or not or, or whatever. It's just, it's the experience. And um, so that was important to me throughout this book. I'm, I don't have a degree um, in art history or any kind of degree in art and, and so, or any kind of degree. So, uh, so I, um, 
that's the way I've always experienced art, and I tried to transmit that throughout the book. And of course, Saber's work is, um, it's feminist because, and I must say that, I, I'll put a plug in for your book now, uh, Sabra, I came to New Village Press uh, via Sabra, uh, who had published a book uh, called Openings, um, quite a few years before mine, I guess maybe five or six years before mine. And so I discovered the press through her beautiful book. Uh, Sabra was very instrumental in uh, the women's art movement in New York in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, right? And uh, with other women, protested in incredibly creative ways, uh, did things that really uh, are responsible, I think, in, in grand measure for the fact that there were some women now, some women artists being shown in museums, still not as many as they should be. But um, you know that was an important movement. And um, so for anyone interested in that movement, Openings is an extraordinary uh, book with, uh, I think, a thousand full color photographs. I mean, it's one of these amazing books. You can't imagine that it's only $30 because um, it's so beautiful. There were two things in that chapter that you wrote that I wrote down. So obviously they were um, something that struck me um, as interesting and fundamental to what you were talking about when we discuss women's relationship with creativity. And the, the two things that I wrote, well, three things that I wrote down, one was creative catharsis. The other one was the connection between intimate and public spheres was both a revolution, oh, a revelation and a relief. And then the third thing was cellular memory. And to me, those were all incredibly poetic ways of talking about Sabra's work, but I also felt like they were your connection to the way that you were thinking about your own creativity as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that for somebody my age, and I'm 85, um, or Sabra's age, who's just a few years younger, um, for someone, from, for a woman from our generation, um, making art was not easy, you know. It was something that we had to do, and we had to do it um, uh, with enormous obstacles. If we wanted to uh, also be lovers and mothers, and, <laughs> and if we had to work <laughs> to earn a living, um, and all the things that everyone has to do in life, um, art was often something that was relegated to, you know, the wee hours of the morning, I remember there was a whole period in my life where every book I wrote was written between 11 at night and 3 in the morning. Um, and you know, I look back on those, uh, those, those books and I, I think, you know, some of them are not bad books, but all of them would have been better books if I had had uh, the possibility to prioritize my work as a writer. Uh, and not do it after everything else, you know, after four kids and cooking and working and so forth. So um, I just think that, um, you know, and most of the men that I knew when I started out knowing uh, visual artists in New York, many of the men and women, many of the married couples or couples, um, both of them were artists, you know, and I could mention Robert Frank and Mary Frank, or Willem and, and Elaine de Kooning, Pat Pasloff and Milton Lesnick, etc. In most cases, the woman also kept the house, sometimes was the only uh, earner, you know, at a, at a steady job. If they had children, was the mother. Um, and the man, you know, was able to prioritize his work. And um, so, Women in my generation had tremendous obstacles um, just to do the work that we were called to do. And, um, you know, I think it is a little easier today. And certainly some of the women in this book um, made it easier because they demanded, such as O'Keefe or um, de Kooning or, you know, uh, Ferdy, uh, Mary Elizabeth Jane, Jane Coulter never married. Um, 
and she was deeply resented. I remember not too long ago, maybe 10 years ago, Barbara and I were at Grand Canyon, and we were in a room where she designed uh, the fireplace. And there was a man there, you know, just selling postcards and art books and so forth. And we remarked about the fireplace, which is extraordinary. Uh, and he said, well, she was, you know, she was a bitch, I think was the word that he oh, used. Right. Um, I never would have worked for her. Now, this was a man today, so many years after she died, with her body of work. Um, women are often resented for, you know, taking the lead in, in prioritizing their work, so I think I'm going off on a tangent. It's <laughs> a, a good story. That's... It would be really remiss of us this evening if we didn't reflect a little bit on the current moment and understanding myself as someone who will return 50 this year means I've spent my entire life um, with the perception that certain rights were my rights too. And now I have two teenage daughters who will now have to fight a fight that I didn't uh, thanks to you and the women that came before me. So I hope that's where we can end up. But before we get there, I think talking a little bit about some of the work that you and some of the artists that you mentioned in the book really um, engaged with, and I'm thinking of um, Jane Norling and the People's Press, and the discussion that you have around her almost guilt um, this debate that she was having between being an artist who was an abstractionist and being an artist who did things that were political and extremely, you know, activist in, in the way that, they, that she was operating. And I have to admit, that conversation really spoke to me because that's a similar battle that I have in my own work. So I was hoping that you would talk a little bit, a little bit about Jane and sort of her internal debate but also of connecting it back to some of the work that you were doing, especially in Mexico, around the publication that you founded there, and how, in some cases, doing the right thing is what propels you beyond, perhaps, some of those internal debates or internal doubts that, that many of us often grapple with. Well, I'm glad you brought this up because I think it's an issue for many uh, artists, not just women, but men as well. Um, men and, and trans artists and all the different um, genders that we have, that we recognize today, which are undoubtedly not all that there are. Um, Jane and I have been friends since 1962. We met in Mexico when People's Press, which was a print collective in San Francisco, sent her to Cuba, and I was living in Cuba, and sent her there to, um, to learn uh, a screen print process that the Cubans were using in their political posters, which were also extraordinarily artistic. Cuba has a fabulous um, history of uh, political posters, which are works of art, probably second only to Poland. Um, so Jane and I have been friends all this time, and Jane has always um, suffered deeply from this issue. Am I doing enough? Jane made her living all these years uh, with the graphics um, business in which she would do um, political propaganda for good people, who candidates, and so forth, you know, and causes. And then she did her art, and there was this separation or her serious art, and it was this separation in her mind. Uh, my, and, you know, I think all of us who are socially conscious have had this experience that we've done work as social activists in whatever, for whatever cause, in whatever field. Um, and then there is our work, uh, which we see as art, and uh, the closer the two can come, uh, the better it is. Um, but sometimes there's a breach there uh, that bothers us. Um, increasingly in my life, it doesn't bother me anymore. I think that um, there's a place for everything. There's a place for all of it. Um, but art is art, and art lives beyond, um, beyond 
the particular issue that it's addressing at the time, my feeling is that. The art that I, that I love, that I go back to. Um, I mean, I have no idea what the issues particularly were in Leonardo da Vinci's time, say, or whoever. And yet, his art moves me, you know. And when I think of Sabre's art, for example, many of your pieces are, they deal with um, a particular issue, a political issue, a social issue. But I love them as art. You know, I, I, they speak to me um, in both of those registers, but the register that matters, that lasts, is the art of it. So um, that's my feeling about that. And I think that... Um, and yes, you know, I, I can remember when Roe v. Wade became law. I helped a friend get an abortion before, an illegal abortion. Um, I, you know, I never expected this to be taken away from us. Um, it cost so much blood, not just labor, but blood. Um, I think that the time that we're living in is incredibly dangerous. Um, it's a real slide into fascism. And I think that, you know, everybody um, who, who feels strongly about it um, is doing what they can. If it's um, helping a neighbor, if it's helping people who have COVID, if it's standing on the front lines in a demonstration, if it's, you know, whatever it is. And we do that with our art too because our art is who we are. But I think that, um, the art is still um, art. <laughs> and I just hope that your daughters, um, you know, will grow up into a, will help make a world where um, these criminals can't get away with what they're getting away with today. I think um, it's about 6.57. Um, I have a few more questions, but I think, do we want to give audience time, a few opportunities to answer questions as well? Yeah. I have a question. We've got one right behind you. First of all, thank you so much. It's a, it's a privilege to be here and to, to be able to hear you in person. Um, I studied at Mexican photography, and I know you were there at a very interesting time. Did you have a relationship with Lola Alvarez Bravo or uh, include her in your publication? Because it sounds like her activism would have coincided. What's your name? My name is Jessica. Jessica. Uh, yes, I I didn't have a relationship with her. I wish oh. I had. <laughs> but I, I, I did know her, and I knew her husband, um, and I knew many of the photographers. So I wasn't doing photography yet um, when I lived in Mexico, but. There's an extraordinary movement, as you know, from and especially from that period, Manuel Alberto Bravo, uh, Lola. Uh, in fact, uh, I wanted to use a photograph by Lola of uh, Frida Kahlo. There's a series of photographs that she took that are just incredible, and I wasn't able to get permission to. This book, by the way, took about three months to write and about seven months to get permissions to use all the, you know, all the 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 artwork. Um, but yes, she she's somebody incredible. This uh, Graciela Iturbide is also a favorite of mine, uh, who's still doing photography in, in in Mexico, and of course there are many others. Uh. There was another question. When you were in New York, the Abstract Expressionist, did you ever meet Joan Mitchell? Yes, I did. Yes, Joan was part of Elaine's group, and I was sort of a groupie, and I I I knew everybody who was in that group you know, to one extent or another. Um, I wasn't close to Joan Mitchell. Um, I knew her, I saw her at parties, and we used to have, we had something called the club, the artist club on 8th Street, and we used to go and you know hang out there on Friday nights and listen to people speak and panels and so forth. Um, I think she was a fabulous artist. Um, and um, there's a wonderful book, I don't know if you are familiar with it, it's called The Ninth Street Women uh, by um, Mary Gabriel, who wrote one of the forewords to my book. And it includes uh, a long chapter on her work. Will you tell us the story of your and Elaine's journey to Wattis? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, um, when Elaine came out here to New Mexico, she was invited in 1957 to, um, as a visiting professor in the art department here at the university. And um, actually, um, Lisa's mother and father uh, often went with us on those weekend trips to Juarez. I was very interested in the bullfights then, much to my embarrassment today. Um, but I thought they were, you know, I was young and romantic, and I thought they were terribly romantic. And Elaine was incredibly interested in um, capturing that kind of, any kind of movement. I mean, when, when, we went to, when I followed her to New York, we used to go to Madison Square Garden and, and uh, you know, for sporting events, and she would uh, sketch. She always had her sketch pad with her, and she did that in Juarez. So we would go down to Juarez, we would spend the night. Um, there's a famous photograph that has both of Lisa's parents and Elaine and myself and Connie, um, Fox, who at that time was Connie Boyd, who was another wonderful artist from this, from that era here in New Mexico, all at some bar um, in in Juarez. So, uh, yeah, you know, I introduced Elaine to the bulls, and and then her um, bull paintings became one of her better known series. The museum has at least one of them, I guess. Yeah, so I think it's called Juarez. It isn't is called it? Juarez. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Great, that's a great one. Yeah. Um, all right, other questions? Sorry, I had to just get that story. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, there was some discussion earlier about the Spanish Revolution and 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 the Spanish and in other books is cellular memory. Um, I, I really feel, I'm not a scientist, but my experience tells me that memory is not just up here. It's, in, we experience memory in our bodies, uh, sometimes very painfully, sometimes um, joyously, um, but always in ourselves. If our minds don't remember something, for sure some part of our body remembers that, and that's what I call cellular memory. I don't know if there's a better term, perhaps, but um, that's what I mean by that term. Lisa. I have a question about <coughs> Albuquerque, um, the old artists in the 50s and early 60s, and the role they played in, in inspiring you, not necessarily my father or anybody specific, but in a, in a general sense. Well, they did inspire me. My, um, our, my parents, I'm going to say our parents because my brother is here. Our, uh, my, our mother was a, was a sculptor for a, a period in her life. My, uh, our father was a musician, so they were people who gravitated towards artists and had artists as friends. And, um, so I met many of those people from the 40s and 50s practically as a child. Um, we moved here in 1947, I was 10 years old. And um, so, you know, I knew uh, Alice and Jack Garber, uh, Howard Schleter, um, your father. They were all friends of my parents to begin with. And then um, some of them became, they were younger than, than our parents. And so, you know, they were sort of in between um, my parents' age and, and my age, and so then some of them became my friends as well. But I remember um, modeling for your father for a sculpture class at the University of New Mexico. I modeled to get, I don't know what it was, maybe $2 an hour or something in those years. This I was think it's still that. <laughs> <laughs> that is obscene. <laughs> your father and also then for Elaine um, in one of her sketch classes and always feeling that I wished that I could actually be working in clay or could be drawing or you know and I remember once Elaine actually gave me tore off a big piece of craft paper and gave me a piece of charcoal and said well go for it you know and I wasn't any good but it was that I mean, art inspires creativity. You know, that's what the connection is. And so, 
um, or one of the connections at least. And so um, when you see a piece of art that moves you, or you see people making art, you feel inspired, whether that's to make an exquisite uh, meal or to write a poem or, you know, or whatever it is that you do, um, have a conversation. Uh, so uh, those, those friendships of our parents um, uh, and those connections did inspire me tremendously. I probably didn't understand at the time, I'm sure I didn't understand the ways in which um, those connections would be important to me in the future, but, but they have been throughout my life. And um, I just, uh, you know, Albuquerque doesn't have the, the kind of fame that Santa Fe or Taos had in the early years. There was the Taos School and the Santa Fe School, and those were artists who were famous all over the world. But Albuquerque had, as you know, and as you've um, made available to people um, through shows and publications and so forth, Albuquerque had a group of extraordinary uh, visual artists in those years, and, and of course still does. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening. Margaret, I don't know if you wanted um, to have any other closing words, but um, it was a pleasure and an honor to get to read your book and hopefully gain some um, important nuggets from it for my own um, understanding of, of participating in this creative world that you reflect so profoundly on. No, the only thing I would like to say is to thank everyone for coming out. Um, in this um, COVID fearful time. Um, and also um, to say that um, I'll be signing books and I hope some of you will want to acquire them. Uh, but also especially to thank Suzanne again and the staff here at 516 and to thank you for your absolutely wonderful questions. I just loved every one of you. <laughs>